Competitions where uh, sort of cooking competitions where we see uh, what type of restaurant menu we can put together, <laughs> and yeah, we, we, we've got a Greek, Greek Syrian background, so we come from a food culture and uh, we know how to cook our own food. So <laughs> yeah, it's just about uh, five o'clock in the morning on Friday, September seventh, uh, two thousand twelve. And we're gonna do our next the next segment of Big Bang Theory for this for this episode. Uh, it ended up being a, a bizarre day. I was supposed to do uh, a segment earlier, but I didn't get around to doing it because I was working on debugging the system. And then I was trying to think of I had a variety I have a variety of segments I want to film today, and I was thinking about how to put them in the different content. If you have a variety of content that you want to put in, you gotta, you gotta think about how you want to do it and what you want to say and so on and so forth. So sometimes uh, that doesn't come to you right away. And particularly if you're uh, researching something uh, on the internet. And this uh, particular thing is um, I'm trying on, on uh, Linux to group a whole bunch of programs together. They have similar functionality, and I sort of want to get one functionality for working from one program to another program. And I was looking through the uh, Linux community to see what's there and what's not there. And it seems like that the area that I'm going into is fairly is fairly sparse. It's not widely populated, uh, and uh, the information just basically isn't there. So that means that I have to, uh, if I want to proceed with it, I have to test bench it first on a spare system before I move ahead. So that moves that uh, research, and it's basically uh, using a program called Aconity. Uh, Aconity, uh, yes, it is Aconity. Uh, it's a program that controls a lot of your personal information, like a calendar, uh, organizer, every, every, even your email. It connects all these things together, so it knows a, a back end. But the thing is, is it ties into very specific programs. And uh, if you're doing open source and you're doing an open desktop, then programs on open desktop, desktop and open source should interconnect with each other. With, you know, you don't, in other words, it shouldn't lock you into a particular choice a program, you should have a flexibility for that. Uh, and it says this program does have flexibility to do that, but the instructions on actually how to do it really aren't that clear. And so it really has to, this is something that has to be worked on to get it working, and particularly uh, my mail client, uh, they have the mail client uh, Kmail. My particular uh, preference for, uh, for email client is Thunderbird. And rather than having Kmail work with Aconity, uh, I want it to work with Thunderbird. But that is, it, it's supposed to take care of it automatically, but it's not doing that. Uh, it's failing, uh, even though I've specified that I want Thunderbird to be the default, uh, 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 mail, uh, default uh, mail client, it's not using Thunderbird as that default mail client uh, in terms of how uh, Econity actually deals with uh, the mail system in terms of bringing mail in and bringing mail out. And there doesn't really seem to be 
a, uh, uh, how should I put this, a means of doing this. So, the, the key here is that, that this is kind of what I want to sort of figure out, is I want to sort of figure out how to integrate uh, Thunderbird in with Econity. And, but as I said, the information on it is uh, very sparse, it's not really there, and so it, but it took me basically until around 3.30, 4 o'clock to kind of figure it out. Then I was also watching some documentaries, and so by the time I finished doing all that, now here it is, 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, this is just the second segment, and we're going to be filming a whole bunch of segments in a row. So, <laughs> that's kind of the way things go, and there's not really much you can do about it. Uh, I have a couple things that I'm going to get to there, but, and it's, they're kind of related, but also, the, this is, will tell, let you know a little bit about the diversity that you have on, on YouTube, is that on YouTube, uh, there are a whole variety of different uh, communities out there, and you can go around and see what everyone's sort of talking about, what their opinions are, and you can share opinions on YouTube. And one of the, the one of the sort of the uh, the main groups, not really, I guess yeah, I call it a main group. They're the ones who operate VidCon. Uh, and if anyone knows about VidCon, uh, that's Hank Green, John Green. And the uh, DFTBA and don't forget to be awesome. Uh, all of that comes out of uh, that John Green group uh, group there. That's all VidCon. There's a whole bunch of people that are hi highly involved, heavily involved with it. And every once in a while, they float out. Hmm. Ugh, they float out opinions. Well, the recent one that they've sort of floated out, and I think it was I interesting, and this is at the, I was going by, uh, one of the girls I'm subscribed to, uh, it's called That Hoopy. I went by her page, and she's a, uh, I guess, a college girl. Uh, in her videos, that she was homeschooled. And you, you, uh, you hear it for yourself, and it's about college think. So here's the video. This is a video response. So you'll want to go and watch that before you watch this one. Hey. So in Neil's video, he talked about how he wished that he would have considered more options before signing up for college. And he wishes that he would have had an internship or shadow position so he could see really what like the professional aspect of what he wanted to do looked like from the inside sort of and for my whole life I've wanted to do theater as a career pretty much like since I was seven a long time however throughout my high school career I did a lot of environmental projects slowly but surely that began to happen more and more in my junior and senior years I worked in both the environmental nonprofit industry in a professional capacity and in the theater industry in a very professional capacity and I really learned what it takes and what you need to be successful in both of those fields and what it was like to work in those fields and I realized that I didn't want a degree in theater that doesn't mean I don't want to learn about theater and that doesn't mean I'm not going to take theater classes while I'm here at college I just don't want a four-year degree for it because I don't want that to be my career and I realized that environmental science is totally awesome and that I love it a lot and that I want to change how people see urban forestry I got really excited about it and that's what I'm doing for college now I think that that's really an important thing to do in high school is career exploration and job experience in the fields that you think you want to work in, if you have a specific field that you think you might want to work in. I think that that's definitely what high school should be for. I mean, I was homeschooled for all of high school, and so I don't really know much of what people do in high school. What I did for high school was I did, like I said, I did a lot of career exploration, and I worked with a lot of professionals in fields that I was interested in, and then I took community college classes for all of my classes, pretty much. And I've talked to a lot of people who go to public high school in the U.S., and my sister went to high school for one semester. She didn't like it very much. She felt like she wasn't learning anything. She was just in school doing work. I don't really understand what high school's for. I think that college should be learning 
I don't think that it should be schoolwork. I think that you should be able to learn about what you want to learn. And it shouldn't be focused on taking classes you don't want to take and having to do extra hard work in them. Yeah, some people have to take some classes. Like, I'm taking math. I'm going to need algebra. I'm taking college algebra class. I don't want to, but I know I'm going to need it. But I don't think that it's important to have four or eight years where you learn stuff that you don't want to be learning about because then you're not really learning. You're just remembering information for like three months and then forgetting it all. I think that a college degree is important if that's what you want to do, if you want to go and learn more. Because I feel like that's one of the things people forget a lot about college is that it's about learning. And I know people talk about like the college experience, but it's not just about like hanging out and doing exciting things like road trips and being a crazy young adult person. I think it's also about learning about what you want to do for your life. And that's why I think college isn't a waste if that's what you want to be doing. And that's just me. If you have any opinions, let me know. Let Neil know. Let John Green know because we've been talking about that and so have other people too. Join this discussion. So you hear, you hear, you heard her, heard her uh, different views on college, on high school, and so on and so forth. And it's actually quite a common co uh, uh, view and comment about high school uh, and college in terms of not understanding uh, what the class and, and, and the core structure is for. And in many cases. I think that most people, even in the comments below, are picking up some of the flaws in the system. They're seeing some of the flaws in the system, but really don't know how to work around the flaws. Or, but it's not really that. To the, it, it, it's <clears throat> let me uh, <laughs> collect my thoughts and think of how I want to phrase this. It is not specifically that there is, it, 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 I will say it, it, in, in this phrase itself, but it's not a fully correct phrase, it's not that there's something wrong with the school. There are no, in terms of, the school hasn't been properly planned out in terms of they're leaving people out. There's a specific reason for why, what's going on in the schools. There is a think, a college think, and this is the title of her, uh, of her video. There is a college thing that is based on a group think as to how people should be. And in other words, what colleges think about and what teachers think in terms of who design these programs in college and in high school, what they think about these researchers is how to shape young minds. In other words, they understand, and the people who do, who, who, work, go, who go into education, particularly the upper levels of education, who go into the design of education, understand this, that what is presented to people, in, um, or in, uh, I'll say kids, in high school and in college, is that they, they know that this information, and what they give, will shape who they are and how they think X number of down X number of years down the road when they enter the workforce and they enter into call it mainstream society. And they are trying to form and shape ideas to their own particular thoughts and ideas of what these standards should be. And this is a complex thing is because you have to go into the very philosophy and understanding of education and thought itself before you can understand why many students feel the way they do about their classes and being pushed or molded. And that's what their students are talking about. They're being feeling they're feeling pushed and molded in in, in, in these programs and in these that sort of that period of, of time that they're being pushed and pulled and needed and prodded and uh, and all these different things. In other words, they feel uncomfortable that they they're not free to go and do as they please, uh, that there's a lot of pressure to conform. And there is, but there is, this, there is this very specific reason for this. And it has to do with the philosophy of education, and it has to do with philosophy itself. And so that's why, it, it actually, the best way, I think, to answer this is to not specifically come up with an answer, a, a, a 
very specific answer, but to go into and show that the thinking and the philosophy behind it of, of the education system is where the problem resides. And to show the type of thinking that goes on. So I am going to do that uh, in the next segment because I am going to bring this into the next segment. It is part, and then you'll see how one topic may intersect and, in, and integrate with another topic. In this next section, we're going to continue on and go into uh, and, and somewhat answer uh, that Hoopy's uh, video on college think. And this is where I kind of have to think about things. I do have to sort of mull over how I'm going to phrase things. Because it, this is not an easy topic, because it intersects with the, uh, the, the previous topic that we were talking about, and that's the, uh, the uh, gay mythology and gay marriage. And because, although it's not presented as a philosophy, as a religion, as a thought, and a concept, but rather as a natural phenomenon, natural reality, uh, it is not this, even though it is presented as such. And it has to do, this presentation, these assertions, has to do with uh, the academics and the intellectuals who uh, bring forward this state of academics and ac academic institutions. And this actually goes back, the academics and academic institutions go very far back uh, and have a surprising birthplace. Most academic institutions that are known as, that, uh, uh, that form uh, the collective group known as Western Thought, these, these are the schools that form the, ba the basis of that, were not actually intell schools of, intel of intellectualism. Intellectualism uh, is a philosophy. It's an emerged philosophy. It doesn't, didn't come out by itself. Uh, it was not invented by, n invented by the Greeks, but invent, uh, in terms of the Greek philosopher, but invented uh, uh, basically more than a thousand years, several thousand years later. Yeah, well, yeah, let's see. B.C. is when you had your philosophers, uh, and you're talking about uh, the emergence of well, Western thought and Western philosophy. Uh, really uh, sort of uh, blossomed and emerged in the 1700s. So, even if, you know, you're looking at about 2,000 years, so you're looking at a minimum of 1,700 years uh, between, uh, between the Greeks or in Greek thought and Greek uh, philosophy and uh, the growth and uh, the outgrowth and the sort of the emergence, the birth of uh, Western intellectualism. And Western intellectualism, ironically, even though it stands against the church, or what call the, the, but it calls the church, uh, is, but it calls the church, again, is not properly defined. It is a very specific term relative to the intellectuals and intellectualism. And the church they're talking about is not the, the, the original ancient church of Christ around 0 AD. They're talking about Roman Catholicism, which emerged around 1000 AD and had, again, its philosophy and, and understanding, its theology and understanding of the Christian Church was fundamentally different from what was there a thousand years ago. So, in other words, you talk, you, when you're talking about uh, thoughts and ideas and, and emergence of philosophy, you have to be specific about who they're actually talking about, who they're referencing to. Whether or not it's a proper, uh, you know, whether they're talking about the real ancient church, or they're actually talking about Roman Roman Catholic, or uh, other philosophers of their period in time, and you will see thought and philosophy evolve and change over uh, a period of right now it's about let's say it's just about 300 years since the 1700s, and so over the period of 300 years there has been significant change uh, in, uh, 
in a philosophical thought. To give you an example of how this actually works and how thought has evolved, and I'm talking particularly more about Western thought, postmodernism post -modernism doesn't start until, the 19th, not until 1945. Postmodernism gets its beginning uh, in 1945. You have, prior to that, modern philosophy, which it, it goes from basically the late 1800s, let's say 1890, to give you a, a rough date, and we're not going specifically here, we will, we will if we need to go into these things further, uh, and this will be maybe at another topic, and you know, it'll be a, ten, it'll be a tangent, tangential study. In other words, it will be something that we've done off to the side, and that will have intersections to what we're talking about here. And this, and on the side here, this is where I'm saying this thing gets get kind of complex, and it's not your standard uh, high school university experience. This is research outside of that. This is discussion outside of that. So, but anyways, uh, back to what we were saying. What I was saying, anyways, is that. Uh, uh, modern philosophy was 1890, approximately, to 1945, and again, approximately. Prior to 19, uh, 1890, you had what they call classical philosophy. And so, from 1700 to just about uh, well, 1890, and that's about uh, 190 years. You had cla all that was classified as uh, as what you call it as classical philosophy. And what you had in in that period, the, that that 100, 190 year period, is you had the beginnings of science. And as science evolved, and as science began to evolve more rapidly. You get a speeding up and a, and, a, and a changing, a shifting in philosophy. And philosophy is blown out of the water, so to speak, in 1945 by the atomic bomb. And this is what brings in postmodernism. Because modernism and the classical philosophy was based on a certainty of, of the ab and, and the absoluteness of the intellectual mind that everything with that everything that uh, we see and perceive in the world is subject to the human mind and that there's really nothing that the human mind can't encompass. And most of your universities in intellectual environments were designed and built and framed that they're basically their their frame and structures are built in this classical uh, uh, modern philosophy idea of absolute knowledge and that there's something things are absolutely right and they're absolutely wrong and you have to have these uh, what they call academic mathematical proofs of things and you'll spe see a lot of professors spend an enormous amount of time on mathematical proofs. The problem came in in 1945 with the atomic bomb that it was based on a, uh, the atomic bomb brought out a whole new uh, paradigm in physics uh, uh, that basically ended up becoming quantum mechanics. And its whole basis was that there was no certainty in reality, that our ability to learn and understand was asymptotic. In other words, that we could not know something or anything, absolutely, but we can approach that knowledge to a certain degree, and our knowledge would, would uh, in, in terms of its approach, it would be in, what we call in the limit. So the way it would be phrased is that there is a line here. And let's do this graphically here. There's a line here, and you want to approach this line. That line is knowledge, the absolute knowledge, and you're approaching it. You never actually get to the line. You have to get closer and closer and closer. But you never actually get there. At some point in time, you can say in the limit that you are sufficiently close to the line that you have achieved this knowledge. And while, again, this is true to a certain degree, 
science would, the, and the research would later show up, not science because science is not a person, I would say the research would demonstrate uh, that this was not the case. In other, in other words, knowledge was conditional. And the amount of knowledge that you had also was conditional on the amount of, the number of pieces you have in this puzzle of knowledge. And you would have to go into to further understand this, and this is where we would have to get into this on, on, on a better level, is in order to understand the asymptotic nature of, of knowledge, would have to get into uh, derivatives, uh, limits, I should say limits, derivatives, and integrals. These are the basically the fundamentals of calculus, and so we're getting into a very complex topic now, and so I'm not going to do that, go into that now, because it is complex, but showing you here that this is where things are going with knowledge, that in postmodern postmodernism, uh, when faced with the science, the scientific reality, and this is what the atomic bomb did, Atomic, the atomic bomb in 1945, when they saw the atomic bomb, it brought out in the academic world this sense of uncertainty. And when this sense of uncertainty passed through the the the, the uh, quarter, the academic quarters of the philosophers who influenced uh, the, the English lit majors and most of the humanities, the arts, and so on and so forth, uh, this postmodern course, Martin said that the old intellectual style of thought of absolute and proofs was dead. And so what happens is you have a dying of academics in 1945 and intellectualism and the emergence or the, 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 the rising from the grave, if you will, of postmodernism. So basically, intellectualism today is a postmodernist form of, uh, of intellectualism. The, pro the older intellectualism is dead because the scientific base upon which classical and intellectual, uh, 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 classical and modern intellectualism was based on, was literally pulled from underneath it. It was literally destroyed and crumbled with the Heisenberg uncertainty, with the Heisenberg uncertainty, uncertainty principle. And that's the one you need to go look up. You need to go look up Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, I said you're going to have to do some research and reading on your own if you want more immediate answers, but uh, if you don't want to do that, I will be going further into that Heisenberg on sentencing principle. Not specifically here, but I will do more here on it, but it's going to be in other documentaries, particularly in the astronomy and physics uh, uh, documentaries that I'm working on. That will be there. But, as I said, as this particular, as this understanding of science, and this is particularly in physics that I'm talking about, because physics start, uh basically back from 1900, the, the movement away from uh, standard, uh, the standard classical and modern thought began in 1900 uh, with, uh, the, uh, uh, with, uh, with the, with the, with, 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 uh, Planck, I gotta sort of go back and look at, it was basically the demonstration that uh, and this is what Einstein picked up on, that light was both a wave and a particle of time. In other words, they're talking about particle-wave duality, and this is where Einstein comes up with E equals MC squared, showing that not only did light have this unique uh, wave-particle duality, uh, that, but all material, all atoms, had this exact same structure. And this was sort of the birth, the, the, the beginnings of quantum mechanics, and this is what comes, how, this is how you get the work in particle physics with the Higgs boson, the uh, CERN, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, and all these other different things. All this stuff comes out of this uh, this model of uncertainty, the, the understanding of the atomic model, that uh, things weren't necessarily as they appeared, and in many cases, because they existed in a in a, in a bizarre, an almost contradictory pr uh, prob probable universe. Uh, one can view the the new the modern physics of the time, the quantum physics of the time, to be in in stark contrast to the logical universe of the classical and modern intellectual thought, and so it can be viewed from the standard uh, uh, academic position. And when the academic position right now is still stuck 
within this dead um, classical and modern thought. It's still there in the absolutes of thought and, and the authority of thought. This is why you have the whole structure of the universe the way you have it, where teachers give you the mark, you have these classrooms, you have these standards of, of what's right and what's wrong, and there is no peeking out around the corners. In other words, when you're in that academic box, and the academic wall sets for you to bind the institutions of the academics and, and the academia, then you do not leave that box in grouping because you are told not to. In other words, all of the knowledge that you have is subject to the authority of the higher academia. And if you violate that, you are thrown out of academia and considered to be a rogue, to be a nutcase, and so on and so forth, and uh, your work is discredited. In other words, there are taboo areas in academia uh, where they say the light doesn't shine and you're not supposed to go there because you want to stay where the light is, right, to be enlightened, and they tell you not to go into the dark corners. Well, <laughs> unfortunately that world has collapsed, and in, 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 as physics and astronomy has, has moved forward, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and the work at CERN, more and more of this is showing up that the uh, classical universe uh, that academics is built on is no longer there, that it is a probabilistic universe, it's an, anti, uh, it's an anti-logical universe based on um, a, what we call a bizarre form of probability where it's very, it, no matter how close you get to something, and you can do all the modeling you want to do on something. You can build as many mathematical models as you want. The mathematical model will never show you exactly what you have in reality. It will only be, even to your best effort, an, appro an approximation. And that's what the Heisenberg, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle said. But it, it was particularly applied to atomic physics. Atom and atomic physics said. It is, it for, this is for the measure of electrons, and anyone who has studied the high, high school uh, chemistry and high school physics, and you talked about the atom, you saw these little balls and blobs, and you played, you know, you, you, you did this stick and ball model of putting together a molecule or an atom, right, of a, of a particular, you know, of a particular thing. And you saw these balls as orbitals, and so, you know, as where the electrons are, and so on and so forth. But what they didn't tell you is that these balls don't exist. These balls that, they, that you're using are the, is a result of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says, this is where you will probably find an electron. This is where you will probably find uh, another particle, a proton, a neutron, a neutrino, an anti-electron neutrino, uh, beta particles, and so on and so forth. In other words, uh, the positions of things in uh, in atomic physics are not certain. They're not given as an as an absolute. They're given as a probability. And one would say, and this is where philosophers came in, in, in postmodernism said, "Oh, okay, nothing's real." And this, out of this, because they got this idea that nothing is real, that life in the world is merely a perception. They went from having an, abs an absolute control of the mind in the universe and having absolute knowledge to having no knowledge whatsoever that everything in life that you see, gender, so on, uh, reality, uh, injuries, this and that, whatever matter was, everything is a concept and nothing is real. And out of this, the two, that's the basic philosophy that emerged in postmodernism. And out of this came two particular groups. And these were uh, groups that existed before 1945, but they real sort of their proof had really come forward in that in, in that period. And these are groups. This group were the uh, this are the deconstructionists, and they were the anarchists and the nihilists. You know the nihilists as the hippies. Uh, they are free love, free everything, free this, free that, and believe that as long as society itself is fundamentally destroyed, that everything else will be okay, and that you can live and be free as you want. Uh, the other side to this were the uh, anarchists, and the anarchists are along the lines of the Nazis, 
who believe that uh, thing that society had to be actively and physically destroyed. So these are the two thoughts that come out of, of postmodernism, along with postmodern art, which says that art isn't anything that can be defined. It is in the eye of the beholder, and that anything you do uh, is art. And this is the birth of the modern art movement, and this is why you see people who are spitting on canvases, or peeing on canvases, or, you know, taking a crap on a canvas. As long as it's something smeared on a canvas, uh, or something along those lines, uh, then you can call it modern art, and you can walk around, and uh, as long as you have the attitude, uh, you can be a modern artist. Or actually, not even... Uh, and this is where the term gets confused. You, to be a modern artist, you have to be postmodern. So, in other words, you have to be... To be a modern artist, you have to be after the modern art. There's a contradiction in terms of an oxymoron for you there. Um, but, as I said, this is, this is how intellectualism, and where intellectualism sits, sits today, intellectualism has never left the old academic uh, environment. The old academic environment is still uh, that you see today in the, on the universities and in, in the high school is still fundamentally based in the classical and modern philo philosophical thought, the Western thought that says that the mind is absolute and everything is subject to the mind. And because of this, because of this thinking, each generation tries to construct a paradigm as to how thought should be and how adults, young adult, how, uh, how adults should think. And because these, these academics think this way, they always are trying to tinker and restructure uh, high school and university to bring out these new paradigms. Every generation, every ten years or so, there is a new paradigm that is brought in by academics that attempts to bring in a new paradigm of intellectualism. But every time that paradigm moves through, invariably there are multiple failures, and that paradigm at some point in time will fail and collapse. And this is, can easily be seen in what's going on now in, with the uh, economic situation in Europe, where you have people starving, starving to death in the streets. And it, it, you can go back into, into, into any uh, the so-called intellectual-based societies where they had gotten rid of some of the older societies and see the collapses that are occurring there. It's, there is a history to look back on. Unfortunately, because everything is a concept and everything is an opinion, this history doesn't matter to intellectuals. And so they are willingly, in, and this is what ignorance means, they are willingly, you know, they're willingly blind to their own past. They are ignorant of where they came from. And because of this, because of this blindness, they're going to repeat the mistakes, they're going to repeat the destruction that has occurred to them in the past. But they will never admit to this. And this is what you see uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, at the DNC. Uh, at the DNC. When you look at the, uh, uh, the speeches that, that Clinton gave, or that Obama would give, what did you see? Everything's going fine, everything's going great, we all need to work together. They talk about the, the situation, you know, the, how Europe is doing so well, and the things are going, you know, and like Europe isn't doing well. There's a, it's an absolute mess. You talk to people who actually live in Europe, who live in Greece, and things are not going well. In other words, what you hear on the stage, what you hear in the news, what you hear in school, is political rhetoric, it's indoctrination. It is uh, what they call groupthink or college think, and this is why it's, it's very difficult for many people to really break outside that box because they feel that when they are breaking outside this box, that they're doing something wrong because you've been told all these years, from basically junior high on up, that if you go outside the box, you're wrong then it's not the good thing to do. That you will not be successful if you go outside the box. But this isn't the case. In many cases, the people who, who change the world, who change the paradigm, 
for real are not the ones who are inside the box, but the people who venture outside the box. And But it, there's always a risk when you go outside the box. There's always a risk, because you're going into uncertainty. But the choice is yours. Do you want uncertainty and maybe something rewarding down the line and go outside the box and be, you know, be that, that, that trailblazer, but you're more than likely going to fail. There's a lot of fun with that that's going to happen. Or do you want the certainty in life? You know, the choice is what you want to do. If you if you want the certainty in life, you put your blinders on and you do what you're told. If you don't want to put the blinders on and do what you're told, then you move up to the box. So, this is uh, how in academics, intellectualism, and the Heisenberg and Sinti, uh, Heisenberg and Sinti uncertainty principle play together and why it affects what we do and how we do every single day and also how it, it, this will give you an idea of where this the, uh, the whole concept of homosexuality came from. And homosexuality is a concept that has never left the conceptual stage. And this is why there is gay mythology, not gay reality. Professor of what? Professor of Physics. Free speech rules here at Democratic Earth.